on this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Hacker and Layman, presented by Riverwind Casino. We talk OU spring practice by answering some of the questions that you guys have about the team right now. Then we talk about the Oklahoma City Thunder securing the number one seed in the West, and we give you our winners and losers of the weekend. Please download and subscribe to the podcast, rate it five stars, and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right, our man Michael Hosty will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Sunday, April 14th, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Layman, presented by Riverwind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience, and there's so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful, award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including Blackjack, Blackjack Match Roulette, and Teddy's favorite, Craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades and hearts. And to learn more about their gaming promotions and entertainment options in the month of April, all you got to do is visit Riverwind.com. Riverwind Casino, simply the best. Ted, spring game's less than a week away. Crazy, isn't it? It's uh we'll we'll get to the masters, people. We'll talk it, it got boring <laughs> at the end. Scotty Scheffler's an absolute machine. We'll talk about it, but we're starting with the OU football stuff and right around the corner, man. I know. I know it's it's flown by. Um you know, there's a bunch of questions uh to be answered still this spring, and I think we'll find out some of those things during the spring game. I mean, it's it's the it's the uh, the grand finale of the spring, so we get to kind of see what all's unfolded throughout the practices. So I'm looking forward to it. I'm with you, man. And we thought the best way to lead up to next weekend would be to answer some of your guys' questions that you still have about where the team is at right now in spring practice. All The hay is not exactly all in the barn, but – it's pretty dang close, Ted. So let's get right to it. This first one comes from at Mitch Kramer DZD. He asks, in your honest opinion, based on what you've seen at practice, do we have work to do in the portal for the offensive and or defensive line? Um, I think that it would help depth wise. You know, I'm just starting with the offensive line. Whenever you, when you pull who's a perceived starter out of the lineup, it exposes you to really quick and shows you, you know, what could happen if, if a guy goes down early in the season or in training camp. So I think without Troy Everett there, you know, I feel like we had the same type of situation in year one under Venables. And you kind of find out really quickly that maybe you've got some more work to do. So I would say that, yeah, I think that I think they probably try and get back to the transfer portal on the offensive line, the defensive line. I think it's maybe a little bit different. Now I know there's one defensive tackle, that kid from Indiana that they've got an offer out to. I don't know if there's any others, but I think it's fair to say at this point, you're, I think your two freshmen are probably ahead of what you imagined. And that has probably changed your feeling on the defensive line transfer portal. If those guys didn't look like they'd be able to play in year one, there may be a lot of panic whenever it comes to the defensive line. So I guess my answer to that is yes, but I'm not necessarily panicked about it, if that makes sense. I think that we've been pretty open with our opinion that it would be beneficial. Like if there is a, there's a really good offensive tackle that makes it known that he's going to the portal and you can add him. I think that's a position where if you could add a veteran guy that's played a lot of football at a high level, you add him if you can. Now everyone, every team in the country is going to be trying to add those types of guys. So it's going to be very competitive in a lot of different ways, right? We know how this thing works now, but 
Ted, I agree with what you said about the defensive tackle position before spring practice. You know, before I went out there, I would have said, Hey, you got an ad, you got to add another veteran defensive tackle. After seeing Jaden Jackson and just seeing David Stone and how his body's developing, do you really want to take reps away from those guys? There, because there's a delicate balance of addressing your needs with the portal and developing your young players that you think are going to be really, really good. This just in guys get better at football by playing football. So I, I view the defensive tackle position a little differently after, after seeing Jaden Jackson and David stone in person. Now, if some stud defensive tackle reaches out to you, reaches out to you in some form or fashion, are you going to tell him no? <laughs> Probably not. That's the that's kind of the the weird spot that college football is in right now. You got an opportunity to make your roster better, you probably take it, you know. And and that's specifically on the the offensive and defensive line. But you know, I not to uh, not to pick at old wounds, but it's crazy looking at it now. We knew it's not like I thought it wasn't going to be impactful, but that Caden Green transfer was was brutal, man. It brutal. hurts. It, it hurts. hurts. I mean, we don't. Have to, it <laughs> it hurts, and I, I do think you got a couple guys banged up on the offensive line right now. Right, Daniel Akinkumi, uh got hurt. Uh, Everett had the knee surgery. I mean, Jacob Sexton was playing left guard, starting at left guard in practice this week with Tarquin at left tackle. Bill Beanbow was always willing to try different things uh, to get the most effective five on the field, but is Jacob Sexton a left guard? I, I don't know, but that is the, the offensive line situation. I think that's one that's going to continue to be addressed in the spring transfer portal window, but you're you're gonna you're gonna have to be willing to let's just be real, you're gonna have to be willing to pay. That's just yeah. kind of where we're at in college football. If you wanna if you wanna upgrade at the tackle spot. And you really don't know if a, an upgrade's gonna become available. I mean, that's that's what makes this entire thing even more interesting. Yeah, the second portal window uh the panic portal the price may be expensive right <laughs> whenever you know everyone's addressing the needs post spring maybe there's been an injury or two so yeah it's uh it's fascinating so i i mean just to sum it all up i think we both agree like if you have an opportunity to make your roster better you probably take it but you know i don't think you go out there and just add people to add them at this point yeah, I think that that sounds about right to me. All right, next question comes from Clement Akufo. He asks, besides Deion Burks, Jalil Farouk, and Nick Anderson, who is the next wide receiver to have a breakout season? This is a good one. Man, um, that's taken a, a a big group there. I mean, th th those are your those are your three starting wide receivers. This, I if everyone is healthy, those are going to be your three starting wide receivers when you're in eleven personnel with Bauer Sharp at the tight end spot. So, conversation starts with Jaden Gibson. I think he is. I, I I think they consider him a starter as well. Yeah. I think he is, especially with how many guys have been banged up throughout spring ball. I mean, you think Farouk breaks his foot. Brennan Thompson has been in and out seemingly like he has his entire career since he got to Oklahoma. Nick Anderson's missed a lot of practice. So a lot of guys have gotten a lot of different looks. And, and Jaden Gibson, to me, he does – he looks improved physically. It's as fast as I've ever seen him play. So – that's probably the easiest answer. Yeah, I think that's where I would go. I would go definitely with Jaden Gibson. Um, you know, in the slot, if you want to move to the inside, maybe seeing some rotation with Burks. I like Pedway a lot. 
you know, he's another small burner uh, that's got a nice little build to him. He can move. He's got some shake after the catch. Um, you know, and some of the young guys they've said have performed well. It's hard, though. I mean, it's it's a deep group. It's hard to get a lot of looks. But I think my Jaden Gibson is, I think he's like their scrappiest. You know, he's got the edge to him in, in that group. Uh, he competes like crazy. He's always kind of on that line of out of control, which I tend to like. You got to have a couple of guys like that. Um, if he can, if he can keep his the mental aspect in tune, I think Jaden Gibson could have a really nice year. Is is Bauer sharp? Is that a cheating answer? Yeah, he said, "Who is wide receiver to have a breakout season?" I would, I would argue that. If you just labeled it pass catcher, you look at the production that Stogner had a year ago, just was not a big part of the passing game. And I would assume Bauer Sharp is going to have a nice increase when it comes to the pass catching production at the tight end position. I, I don't know how big that increase is going to be, but what what we've seen from him when it comes to just how how much – athleticism he's got how well he runs you gotta assume that position is gonna be a lot more productive in the throw game yeah i hope well the interesting thing about tight end that i've i've noticed watching football for a long time the production at tight end isn't necessarily tied to how good your tight end is. It's tied to how much does your offensive coordinator want to highlight the tight end. And if we were to highlight Bauer Sharp, I think that he would have a great year. I think he's going to be great after the catch. I think, you know, you could get him the ball easily on some short, easy stuff and let him go to work. I think he could he could be a, a big threat in the play action game if you wanted to push it down the field some. I mean, I think there's a lot of ways that they could take advantage of his athleticism, but you have to look at it from an offensive coordinator's perspective. I mean, there's there's going to be a handful of guys that you're looking to distribute the football to. You know, where does he end up on that pecking order for the offensive coordinator is really the only thing that I think is really going to limit him. It could be not to dive too deep on what his role is going to be, but it, it could be one of those week to week kind of matchup dependent things mm -hmm. where maybe they have a weakness at safety. A guy doesn't run particularly well, you know, cover it, coverage isn't his strength. And that week you use a lot of Bauer sharp to attack that guy, to attack that weakness. Uh, I mean, may, maybe it'll end up being like that, but I, they do feel they feel really good about the wide receiver position. I going back to the original question, I think if I could trust Brennan Thompson to stay healthy, he would be my selection because that dude can just run. And it seems like when we saw him last year, when he got in, he was making plays. But I, I just don't know if I can trust him to stay on the field. So I you mentioned Jacquez Petaway. I think that's probably the best answer. He he looks stronger. He looks more explosive. He looks good. I, I think he is. He's going to be in the receiver rotation this season. He's going to get a lot of snaps. So when you talk about a jump from production last year, if that's the definition of breakout, right? If you look at his production last year, very little, and, and what it could be next season, uh, I would expect that to be a pretty substantial jump. Yeah, no, I agree. And, you know, the good problem is I think there's a there's quite a few guys that could jump into that role. You never know what happens. And, you know, the guy we didn't even mention is Andrell Anthony, you know, and those first three names that, that were thrown out there. I mean, he's got to factor in with that starting group in some form or fashion. I, I thought he was, before he blew his knee out, I thought he was developing into the best wide receiver on the football team last year. Now everything gets reset when you tear your ACL and we'll, we'll see 
what it looks like for him once training camp rolls around. But if he can get back to form, he he's going to make plays. Good route runner, fast. I, You and I, we were really, really impressed with him before he got hurt. Yeah. And what I like overall is it's a really fast group. I mean, you've got you've got absolute burners in there that are, you know, uh, Dion Burke says, "Hey, Brandon, let's just go ahead and race. Let's see enough of the talk. Let's see who the fastest guy actually is. He thinks he's faster than Brandon Thompson, and I'm not doubting him. Uh, but it just goes to show how fast that group is." Uh, one other thing I want to bring up here. Gavin Sawchuk only had 94 receiving yards last year. You and I, we've talked about the lack of production in the past game from running backs the last couple of seasons. It felt like it, it feels like it's just been an underutilized part of the offense. Maybe, maybe one of these running backs, whether it's Sawchuk or Hicks, whoever. Maybe someone can emerge as more of a pass threat coming out of the backfield. That would be, that would be awfully nice for this offense. I, I mean, I agree, but you know as well as I do, you don't get any drop back pass, so you just don't get hardly like it's got to be like a design swing screen, or like some type of like designed play. I mean, once every five games, we'll get a check down thrown to the running back. But outside of that, I mean, it's just you don't get any drop back pass where the quarterback goes through his reads and dumps it down to a back. You don't create like a Texas route or I mean, we'll see some picks every now and then out of bunch, run a little swing with the with the pick there to try and knock the linebacker off. But it's it. They're just so few and far between. I mean, and I think there's a ton of meat on the bone there because the backers in the in college football just aren't forced to do it. So, I mean, how easy – we talk about it on the broadcast all the time. How easy is it to create situations where the linebackers don't have any idea how you're about to attack them and, you know, they're compromised because of formation? It's – I don't know why it's not done more. Maybe it'll be one of those guys. Maybe. I feel like we've gone through every guy on the offensive side of the ball. We have (laughs) final answer Petaway. Yeah. I like that. Sounds good. All right. This next question comes from Brad Barnett. What's going on, Brad? He asks, it sounds crazy to ask this question. And I'm a hundred percent behind Jackson Arnold and think he is going to light the world on fire. But with all the hype around Hawkins is Jackson Arnold still solidly QB one for August. I think so. My opinion, it, yes. It, this is, and I'm not taking anything away from Hawkins because I think he has looked great. And, you know, not just with my own eyes, everyone else that's seen him has talked about how great he he's looked throughout the spring. And that's a great thing. But you go back a year, it was the same exact conversation about Jackson Arnold a year ago. It's just, I think it's natural that the freshman quarterback comes in and like he's not carrying any baggage. He's not, doesn't have any mistakes that are out there for the world to see. And you can just kind of go out there and compete, not have to worry about everything. You can, you can pull it down and run more, use your athleticism. You know, I, I think returning quarterbacks. I think they they attack practice a little bit differently and it just it sets the stage for someone in Hawkins position to flash more. But I I don't I think Jackson Arnold's going to end up being right where we expect. But you never know. It doesn't take much at all for you know, you start to pile up some mistakes, turning the ball over in practice and the guy behind you is still making plays and taking care of the ball and sharp, accurate, then you just, you never know. And then obviously injury can come from anywhere. I just, I, I feel good about the quarterback situation at this point 
not really no matter what, but I think Jackson Arnold's going to be there, and I think we got a good backup. I'm with you. I do think comparing this year's situation to last year's situation, to me, it's pretty dang different. Dylan Gabriel was proven. He played a ton of football. You kind of knew what his weaknesses were. You knew, I, I think we had a good understanding of what his floor was as a player, but also what his ceiling was mm-hmm. as a player. It's a really good college football player. Jackson Arnold hasn't done anything. It's true. He's got all the talent in the world. I'm very excited that he's at the University of Oklahoma, but we've seen the guy play one and a half games and he didn't exactly light it up. So this is where I'm at with the quarterback position. Neither that nobody in that room deserves to be handed anything. And, and I know that college football works differently now. I understand that. But if I was in that locker room, if I was on that offensive line, give me the guy that gives me the best chance to win. Give me the guy that takes care of the football. Give me the guys that that knows what plays to get us in. Give me the guys that give me the guy that can get me in the right protection that can see blitz is coming and has has the confidence to change plays on his own. Like, give me that guy. Whether that's Jackson Arnold or Michael Hawkins, as an offensive lineman, I do not care. Yeah. No, so I, I that is that. where I, I, I am a – I personally believe that you want as much competition on your team as possible, especially the quarterback position, if somebody hasn't separated themselves. So I I think Jackson Arnold's going to be your starting quarterback. I don't think there's any doubt about that, but that that doesn't mean that there's not competition in that room. There's, there should always be competition, especially because Jackson Arnold, he has not. This isn't a guy that has started two years and played a ton of football and won a bunch of games. That's just, you can't point to that with him. Yeah, which is crazy to think about that we are in a spot where I I like what we've got in Jackson Arnold and Hawkins and, you know, Casey Thompson's going to be there as well. But I can't remember a time we've been in a situation like this experience-wise at quarterback where we're about to go into a season where we don't have We don't have a a returning starter or someone that's got any real amount of experience at all under their belt. I mean, it's been a long time since that's been the case. I mean, you go back, even Rattler had a year under his belt before the 21 season. You know, obviously Dylan Gabriel had played a ton of football. Jalen Hurts had played a ton of football in 19. I mean, it's it's an interesting situation we're in. I I guess from an inexperienced standpoint, Tyler. Yeah, but even but, he like sat for uh, such a long time behind someone, you know, it was. And he had played in some get like he had played. Right. But I don't know. You're right. It is. It's a, I, I do want to say this about Jackson Arnold. With the offensive line issues they've had throughout the spring. I haven't seen that guy lose his cool on that group one time. And I think that shows a certain level of maturity. I think it shows a high level of leadership. I, I It's impressive. So I, I am, I'm excited to see what he's going to be this season. I think the guy's got all the talent in the world, but Hawkins is really, really talented as well. And, and maybe the best thing for Michael Hawkins Jr. is to just sit for a year, develop physically, get a little thicker, add some weight. Uh, But I don't know. I I mean, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how it works out. But I think at this point in time, I would be, I'd be surprised if it's anyone, but Jackson all to run out there week one. Time will tell. I'll I'll say this. I feel like when we come out of the spring game, the temperature is going to be cranked up on that conversation. Michael Hawkins is going to rip off like a 
50 yard run and everyone's going to see how fast he is. And a lot, it's going to start, it's going to start some conversations. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, I hope that happens. At least we need it for the content. I mean, come yeah. on. There's a long, there's a long way between the, the spring game and the opener. I mean, we got to have stuff to talk about. Come on, Michael Hawkins show, show off the wheels. This next question comes from Waldorf man at Waldorf man. Ha <laughs> ha. What, what an interesting handle. I like this question. Apart from offensive line, how does each position group fare with an injury to their number one guy? Last year, wide receiver corner and LB were all solid, but fell apart with one injury. Whose health is most important this year? So from what I understand, what guy in what position group can't get hurt? Is that basically how you're understanding this? Yes. Okay. I like this question. It's a good one. Is it as easy as Bauer Sharp? Ah, uh, that's <laughs> where my head went first. I mean, at running back, you've got like I like Salchuk, but it sounds like Barnes is kind of back to that explosive nature. We got the uh the number one running back in the country from last year's recruiting class coming in in the fall. Um, you know, you've you've added some some depth there. Wide receiver, we just went through the list of wide receiver. Um, defensive line, I don't know that there is the guy on the defensive line or even edge. Backers in a much better spot than we were a year ago. Safety's crazy deep. Cheetah, we've got three capable guys there that you feel pretty good about. I mean, corner, I mean, we went through that struggle last year. so. I, mean, I think you got to talk about tight end. Really, it's just been Bauer Sharp with the first group throughout the entire spring. Yeah. And I have not seen them. They, they've done some short yardage stuff where they'll pull, put a second tight end on the field. But Jake Roberts is a guy that he's played a lot of football. But I just don't think that he has, he has the athleticism that Bauer Sharp has got. Now, he may be a more polished in the run game right with what he was asked to do at Baylor but yeah it feels like tight end we knew tight end was a position of need and, and I'm not sure Devon Mitchell is ready for everything that's demanded of the tight end in this offense quite yet so yeah man it feels like it feels like power sharp it feels like that position right now has the largest drop off from starter to the next guy. But Betchy Wee Wee was in the conversation for me. I I just think with what what they're gonna see week in and week out in the SEC, just how he's built physically, that that's the type of guy that you need healthy, especially going into conference play. And that's not anything against Ozida or any of these guys that could jump in. But you think about right now, the backup right guard, at least from what I've seen in spring, is a true freshman, Eugene Brooks. Yeah. So you would go from Wee Woo, who's played quite a bit of football now at North Texas, you know, not at the SEC level, but he's played a lot of college football. He's 6'4, 320. Long arms. He's got an attitude. I mean, Coach Venables has raved about him throughout winter workouts and now throughout the spring. Like that would not be that would not be a good loss. No. That would hurt I, real bad. You can't afford to lose anyone on offensive line. Like when we get our five set, it's gonna feel like you know, us uh, uh, you you are an injury on the offensive line away from like really having to struggle week in, week out. It, you know, that's just kind of, I mean, there's things that you can do to mitigate the damage, but it doesn't feel like we're all that deep right now. Things could change. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, what we've probably had 12 practices and we'll probably have 40 before our first game. Is that right? You get 30 in training camp and then 
you know, you'll have a, a week leading up and you'll have stuff throughout the summer. I mean, we still have time to develop there, but it's it doesn't feel like we're going to be deep any any spot on the offensive line. I really hope you're wrong. <laughs> Me, too. Me too. I hope I hope the collective goes out and spends some some serious cash in the spring window. We'll see. One last question here. This one comes from at DTB Love 05. Oh boy, this is topical. How the hell did we let a tight end in our own backyard go to Ohio? Ted, I got to assume that that is a reference to Washington tight end Nate Roberts committing to Ohio State. I don't know. I mean, they've they've been in on him from the beginning. They've they've recruited him as hard as anyone. They brought his brother in. I mean, they've spent a lot of time recruiting him. I mean, he's he's wanted to go to Ohio State. It feels like, I mean, that's been one of the, was it Ohio State and Oregon maybe have kind of been the two places for a long time. The kid wants to get out of Oklahoma. I mean, what are you going to say? It Sometimes there's, there's not a lot that you can do. I mean, they've, I'm sure that they've, whatever he's, asked for whatever in NIL. I think they've probably been in line with that. You never know where, where things are going to end up whenever the day comes to to sign on the dotted line, but it's not like it's for lack of attention. I mean, they've given the kid a ton of attention and recruiting. He just wants to go play somewhere else. I, I went to the scrimmage a couple of weeks ago. I'll stand right next to him and his dad. It's not like OU hasn't, been in contact with him and had him out to practice and put a ton of time and effort into getting him to come to Oklahoma. It just, I don't know. I guess just wants to go to Ohio state, but this is the interesting part. Recruiting is different. Now, if you finish second, you never know when it's going to come back around. Maybe yeah, let them go developing for a year or two. You yeah, know? maybe maybe Ohio State. Maybe it goes well there. Maybe it doesn't. I we'll see. Would I have loved for him to have gone to Oklahoma? Yeah, and like you mentioned, Ted, it's it's a long way till signing day. Long way. But Sooner's still putting together a really nice class. I looked it up earlier today. Currently have the sixth ranked recruiting class in 2025. Now Ohio State's got the number one class. But OU has, uh, I mean, they, they've done a really nice job recruiting. So, yeah, it, it hurts for sure, though, because tight end is definitely continues to be a position of need. And once you got the brother in the boat, then you felt like, hey, this is going to be very, very helpful to getting the younger, more talented brother in the boat. And it just, it just didn't work out that way. Ma'am. He's going to find out the the hard way or the long way that you cannot put a price on a 15-minute drive home to get a home-cooked meal by your mom. There, if you have the ability to do that and play big-time college football, oh, my God. It's just – hey, you, everyone has to learn on their own but big mistake. I would take my, my clothes home and my mom would do my laundry. <laughs> oh, isn't it the best ever? And, and mine was like a third, mine's like a 30 minute drive. I was two hours away and I still, I loved going home uh, just to get some, some food. And, and whenever you're, a, when you're a flight away and you can't ever just run home real quick, or, God, that's, can't put a price on it. I agree with that. The only other thing I will say, Columbus is a really cool town, man. It is. It is. It's a big Been there town. twice, and I had a really good time. Fun place. Yeah. It's a fun place. It's, But it's big, man. It ain't, it ain't Washington, Oklahoma, which, you know, is fine. Like, it's one thing to go to somewhere big like that whenever – you could quickly hit the highway and be home to get back to something familiar, but I don't know. It's, it's a great place. It's a great school. 
and they are on a roll right now in recruiting and in the transfer portal. They're they're about to be really good. Biggest city in Ohio, by the way. Fun fact. It's crazy to think about, isn't it? With with Cleveland and Cincinnati, and it's a big state. It's wild. I I don't like the vibes that we just finished the uh, the old spring ball conversation with, but it is what it is. You know, it's very. It was big news this weekend, uh, him him not committing to OU and committing to Ohio State. But it just it, it's not the feeling I wanted as we carry into our Thunder being the number one seed conversation, you know? I, I, I wanted some more positivity, but here we are. I get that, but I guess the reason I'm not down in the dumps about it is because maybe it's not this recruiting class. Maybe it's not next year. But I'm still pretty confident that he'll play football at Oklahoma. Only time will tell. We'll see. We'll see. Let's talk about the Thunder being the number one seed in the Western Conference. Let's go. But first, Love's Travel Stops is now offering a nationwide 10 cent per gallon discount on gas and auto diesel. Just download the Love's Connect app and scan your barcode at the prompt on screen and watch that price drop 10 cents per gallon. Across the country, the Loves Connect app unlocks exclusive deals that can help any traveler plan their route or meal on the highway. So before you hit the road, be sure to download the Loves Connect app to save 10 cents per gallon and experience the country's best highway hospitality at Loves Travel Stops. Loves all says you've covered if you forget your phone charger or headphones with their expanded mobile to go zone. And of course, don't forget to grab yourself some of that delicious Java Amore. And celebrate with a Schooner All-American Ale, the official craft beer of OU Athletics from Coop Ale Works. Named after the iconic Sooner Schooner that races across Owen Field after an OU score, you can join in on the celebration with an ice-cold beer from Coop Ale Works. You can enjoy it at the Palace on the Prairie, at OU Athletic Events, at the bar, at the tailgate, and in the comfort of your own home. For more information on Schooner All-American Ale, visit SchoonerL.com. Must be 21 to purchase. Please drink responsibly. Schooner All-American Ale, the taste of game day. And we love Simple Modern. Simple Modern is an Oklahoma-owned drinkware company who just launched the best cups it's ever made with its new signature line. They're 100% leak-proof, which is what everyone needs with an on-the-go cup, and it has a ceramic coating on the top of the double-insulated stainless steel to preserve the beverage's taste while still keeping it cold and hot for hours and even better simple modern exists to give generously donating 10 percent of all profits so you can know you are helping better oklahoma and beyond with every purchase check it all out at simplemodern.com today football guys talking basketball fgtb said we're going to be talking about the thunder a lot Mm. over the next few weeks that's what happens when you're the number one <laughs> seed. Uh, th- dude, it's just, it's so awesome. And shout out to the San Antonio Spurs. I mean, just pulling off a stunning win against the Nuggets on Friday night that opened the door for this to happen for the Thunder. And I, I just thought there was no way Denver was going to lose that game, Ted. But here we are, just dismantled the G Leaguers that the Mavericks sent out on the floor on Sunday went and watched that travesty that was oh it was gross but hey it was more of just a celebration in Paycom Center Ted how about this the number one seed in the west it's crazy it's crazy Uh, I know we talked about it a lot but the win total was like what 44 something like that and I told I told our listeners you better hammer that over I told you um it all came together really nicely yeah, and they had some guys in and out of the lineup, but they've stayed healthy. They're going into the playoffs healthy. Feels like they, they've got some of their rotation stuff figured out. So, man, I the one seed is is it's awesome to be able to to pull off that accomplishment. But now uh now's where where it all counts. We'll see what see what it's all about in the playoffs, man. I only have one story from the Dallas game that I think you you and a lot of other parents would appreciate. So weird tip time, 2.30, right? All the Western Conference games were getting played at 2.30, which I love that the NBA does that so that 
no team can try to maneuver, even though I'm sure there's some scoreboard watching going on some of those benches. But I we my, we woke my son up at two o'clock, right? It's normally the game is right the right in the middle of his normal nap window. Okay, so we tried to get him down for his nap a little earlier. Woke him up at two o'clock, got him changed, got in the car, headed straight to the arena. Well, he wanted a snack in the car on the way to the arena. No problem. Of course. Get, he loves these little bars. There's just like these little protein bars. He hammers them all the time. Normally takes him, I don't know, 10 seconds to eat it. Like he just destroys these things and give him one in the car. Think nothing of it. Get to the arena, get parked, take him out, holding them, wearing a white polo. Chocolate from the bar all over his fingers. And what does he do, Ted? Just straight across the polo. Just uses <laughs> my shirt as a napkin. And then like looks at me like, hey, yeah, I'm cleaning my hands off. And I was just like, what are you doing, dude? What oh are you? Gosh, that's great. Had to go straight in, straight to the bathroom, try to clean it off as much as possible. Just had giant wet spots on my shirt. My Here wife's like, let's just buy around. you a t-shirt. I was like, I don't want a t-shirt. <laughs> Ended up drying it. It looked okay. We'll see. We'll see if we can get the chocolate out. Shouldn't shouldn't be a problem. But yeah, that's that's about the most entertaining thing that happened in that basketball game. Hey, those stains are from when the Thunder secured the one seed. Hey, that's a good look at you, Mister Positivity. Mm -hmm. I like it. Mm -hmm. So Thunder don't know their opponent yet, and won't know until April nineteenth. Uh, I, the Thunder did announce game one of their opening round series will be played on Sunday, April 21st time to be determined. So you look at the play in situation in the Western conference, you got the Pelicans and Lakers in the seven, eight game. Uh, the winner of that game will be the seven seed and will play Denver. Whoever loses that game will then play the winner of the nine, 10 game, which is Sacramento and golden state. So the loser of the 7-8 plays the winner of the 9-10, and whoever wins that game, that will be the eight seed, and that is who the Thunder will have in the opening round. Everyone got it? Got it. I feel like you are studying, trying to figure out who you would prefer it would be. Well, I feel like the Lakers are going to throw the game against the Pelicans. And then play the winner of sack and, and golden state to try and play the thunder. I want golden state. I, it would just feel right. And yeah. I know that there's also the possibility that they shoot 50% from three in a series and you get knocked out in round one, but can you imagine how much fun it would be to knock Draymond green out in the first round? It would be awesome. But you're you're wagering a lot of emotion on that too, because the other side of that is the worst ever. I, I think that you know Sacramento has given the Thunder trouble over the years. So I I don't think there's an easy matchup. Right. Pelicans have Zion and CJ McCollum and Brandon Ingram just came back. Lakers have LeBron and Anthony Davis. Their team is huge. They've given the Thunder all kinds of problems this year when they've played. Uh, Golden State, Steph Curry, you can you can just never count him out with what he can do with the three. I, there's not a good option, but this is something that it made me feel better about everything because I, I don't think you could be – you can't be scared if you're a Thunder fan. We know the players, that they're, they're not going to be scared, but you can't be scared right. as a Thunder fan. Because I saw this debate going on. Do we really want the number one seed? Listen, there's one team in the NBA that's got a better better home record than the Thunder, and it's the Boston Celtics. That's it. That's the list. Mm -hmm. The Thunder are 33 and 8 at home. Give me this team at home against whoever. You got to beat everyone, anyways. That's true. Might as well. Yeah, Boston was 37 and 4. 
Only only team better than the Thunder. Thunder and the Nuggets, both 33 and 8 at home. So whoever comes out of this playoff play in thing, man, I just you can't you can't be scared if you're a Thunder fan. You just gotta embrace it and know that, that this team plays their best basketball in that building. Yeah. Yep. No, I I totally agree. I'm I'm fairly confident with anyone but the Lakers. <laughs> That's the only team I'm not confident with. Yeah. But I, other than that, you know, I I feel pretty good about it. Mark Dagnall is going to be the NBA coach of the year. Been impressive. Number one seed in the West. It, the the two-year improvement for this organization, especially the way that they've done it, that's, I, I think that's the most impressive thing. Two seasons ago, they won 24 games. They just won 57. How do you I mean, think? 33 ahead, win improvement in two years. It's crazy. It's crazy. And, and with no, with no big free agency signings, this was all through the draft and with guys that were already there that were playing in Oklahoma city that season. I mean, this is a result of drafting Jalen Williams and the other Jalen Williams. And of course, Chet and case and Wallace, what he, what he's done in his rookie year. Stuff like this just really doesn't happen in the NBA. So that's, it just makes it even more, it makes it more fun. And it just makes it more incredible, man. Yeah. Where do you think Dagnall's made his biggest impression on the team? Like what, I, what, what can you point to and say, like, that's his impact? It was pretty funny uh, the other night. And, and I don't know from just from what high level basketball people say about him when it comes to X's and O's offensively and defensively, I think he's really, really good at like scheme. I think he's yeah. really, really good at scheme, but they were playing when they played Milwaukee. We went to that game on Friday night. I think he wanted Shea to hold the ball for like a last, and I think it was at the end of the third quarter. And he just started yelling at him. Like, what are you doing? Why are you shooting the ball? Right. Why did you do that? And like Shea was saying something back to him. But I, I just think there, there's some small moments where I think the dude is, he's got like a, an intensity about him that maybe we don't get to see that often, but I think he holds every guy in the locker room accountable. Yeah. That was one of those moments where I saw it. I just went, whoa, okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah. he is, he's not afraid, but I, I think the thing that you hear the most the most complimentary things about him is, is the scheme stuff. Yeah. I wish I knew more basketball scheme stuff. I wish I knew what to study well, when it comes to all that stuff, but I just, I don't, I don't, I would say that it's from a, another non basketball guy. It's apparent that they know their pieces and it feels like with the spacing and the offense, like they, it feels like they do a really good job of, getting the most out of each player's skill set. And I don't know that that's always the case in the NBA. And it feels like it is with the Thunder. I, I will say there's been, you think about, especially early in the season, it's kind of just been the, the entire season. A lot of people that have a lot of opinions about the Thunder, about, hey, they need to have more size. The rebounding is an issue. And to Dagnall's credit, and it's probably, it may be more Sam Presti than Dignalt, but they've just kind of stuck with those guys. Didn't, yeah. well, didn't make a big move at the trade deadline. They got the Hayward deal done, but a lot of guys, a lot of people wanted them to go get a big man. And maybe that'll end up being a massive issue. And maybe that'll end up being the reason that they have an early exit from the playoffs. That That's very possible, but. You secure the number one seed doing it your way. So I, 
I don't know. I, I think he deserves some credit for you know, knowing what the weaknesses are, but also kind of just embracing and really leaning into the way that they want to play and kind of the style of basketball that they they think is best. Yeah, I'm curious to see, you know, analytically, and I don't know how big they are in the analytics. I know everyone uses them to some degree, but over a long season, I think it's a lot easier to say if we stick with this, this, and this over the long haul, we will be right. And we'll have more wins than if we try to adjust that. I wonder how that plays in the playoffs where it feels like it's a much more by possess by possession game, especially in the second half. It feels like things slow down, grind to a halt. And I don't know. I'm just curious to see how this, the Thunder team responds to a, a little bit different environment. If it turns into a slower half court game, I feel pretty good about it. Yeah. Jay Gilgis Alexander is one of the best house court players in the world. And, and the Thunder's ball movement, the way that they share the basketball, their movement off the ball, I think that I, I think they can play in an up tempo game and I think they can play in a game that kind of grinds to a halt. You just gotta gotta rebound it well enough and not give up a gajillion second chance points. So yeah. we'll we'll see, but why isn't Shea Gilgis Alexander going to win the MVP? Third leading scorer in the league has been a much better defensive player this year. Thunder, the number one seed. What am I missing? Yeah, Jokic is incredible. Jokic is incredible. I, I, I don't know how impactful that loss Denver had. And the fact that they're not the number one seed, I, I don't know how much weight that's going to carry with voters, but I, I just don't see, I don't really see why Shea shouldn't at least finish second. Yeah. I don't know. I, I get, is, is it, I mean, people that follow the NBA, should know i mean they know by now but i guess my my only knock and it's not really a knock but hey you know how the nba is with the whole earn it thing and and go and and have a big impact in the playoffs i don't know is that even something that you knock someone with with the season that he's had i would say no doesn't have anything to do with this season and the numbers that he's put up so that would be the only thing I could come up with to play a uh, devil's advocate. Yeah. I, I don't think he's going to win, but uh, I think it's silly how he's kind of been ignored from some of those conversations over the last couple of weeks. It just, it's just stupid to me. Yeah. Uh, last thing. Chet Holmgren misses his first season. All these people start talking about, Hey, he's too skinny. Uh, he's going to, we're worried about the feet now. It, what happens if he turns out to be super injury prone? All he did was play all 82 games this year. So shout out to Chet Holmgren. That's, that's big time, man. That is, yeah. it's not easy to do. And that's a hell of an accomplishment. And he's going to get, I I feel like he's one of those guys that you're going to have like, five or six years of development before he hits his full potential. He's still incredibly young. So I think, I think he is elite right now as a rim protector elite. One of the best in the league. I think the shooting is going to improve. I, I think he's going to find some, some different types of shots around the basket that are going to be some go-tos. I, I think his offensive game is going to develop a ton from where it's at right now, but at the very least, if he's just an elite rim protector for his career, like he's, he's a hell of a basketball player. He's been, he has yep. been awesome on the defensive end this year. Yep. No, I'm, I'm excited for him. He's going to be great. Uh, one interesting thing. Wednesday's episode uh, ran into our buddy, Tim McMahon 
from ESPN. Uh, a lot of guys that, you know, listen to the hoop collective, know who Tim McMahon is, or you listen to the low post, you know, who Tim McMahon is possibly joining us on Wednesday for a little Love playoff it. preview. Love it. Tim's awesome. Good. So, dude. so we, we, we may be diving into some high level hoops. We'll let McMahon explain everything to us. We'll let him do the heavy <laughs> lifting. All right, let's finish up with our winners and losers of the weekend. But first, all right, all you grill masters, listen up. Didier Ranch delivers premium quality beef that is 100% raised in Oklahoma right to your front door. Go to DidierRanch.com, D-I-D-I-E-R, Ranch.com, to order one of their premium quality beef boxes and use promo code OKLAHOMA15 for 15% off your order. Filet, ribeye, New York strips, sirloin, steak burgers, they've got it all, and they ship anywhere in the continental U.S., and Oklahomans can get deliveries in just one to two days. The only thing better than having a lot of premium beef on the O&D line is having premium beef delivered right to your front door. Didier Ranch, tradition tastes better. And head to the garage for hand-smashed patties, butter-toasted buns, and ice-cold beer. It's the, it's the perfect spot to watch any big game. And with all the garage locations being open at 10 p.m. or later every night, it's the go-to late-night spot. Visit eatatthegarage.com to find a location near you and order online from the garage in your neighborhood. As always, Ted, kick us off. Who do you have as your winner of the weekend? A master's edition, uh, winners and losers for me. And you got to go with Scotty Scheffler as the winner. Just incredible. A lot of people, you know, coming into it, had him as the massive favorite, and rightfully so. The ball striking just fantastic the touch around the greens was great i mean it's like he's holing out or getting close to holing out on on wedge shots and iron shots and just absolutely blistering the drive right down the middle the entire week incredible stuff pressure took a couple of you know he had the lead and there were some guys making little runs here and there but no one could hold the level of play that he had for as long as he did, it was, he was just nails. I never really seen anything like it. It's been a while. He is just smooth as can be. Doesn't really run on a whole lot of emotion out there, which I think is a benefit for him. And he just drills the the golf ball nonstop. You forgot the most impressive thing. He's about to have a kid. Like yeah. there was, that was, that was in play and he had said it multiple times and I absolutely respect the hell out of it that he was going to leave if his wife went into labor. And I, 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 I'm really glad that didn't happen for him because he was clearly the best golfer. <laughs> he was clearly the best golfer playing Augusta national this weekend. And it was, but to have that type of distra- distraction kind of lingering over you, and to go out and play the type of golf that he did. That guy is, that guy's a machine. Unbelievable. Is it a distraction or is it kind of like, um, oh gosh, what's the, uh, for love of the game, Kevin Costner, you know, he's got all the stuff running through his head while he's throwing the perfect game out there. Clear the mechanism. I don't know. He was in the zone, whatever was going on. He was, uh, it was a lot of fun to watch. I mean, I love the shot tracer stuff for him. It's just nonstop crazy. I I was hoping that Max Homa was going to make it interesting. He he seems like the most likable guy ever. Mm-hmm. Uh, never met the guy, but great have heard, sweet. Ha, have heard him on a gajillion podcasts. Uh, he just seems seems like a really good dude. The double on 12 was kind of his undoing. And that's when it, when that happened, it, it kind of felt over to me. Yeah. He had the double there. Um, Oberg had the, what he hit in the water on 10. Um, Morikawa just never really found his, his stride. The double where he, the, what hole was it? I think he doubled, was it nine? 
where he was in the bunker and he just didn't get it out of the first shot. And yeah. I was like, I know what that looks like. I've, it was, it was such a relatable situation. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's what I had as loser was we had, the course was beautiful. The weather was fantastic. I know it was windy on a, what Friday and Saturday for the most part. It looked but, insane on Friday. Yeah, but that doesn't bother me at all. I want the course to play really difficult. I like whenever that happens. Um, and it looked like, you know, coming into Sunday, we were going to have great conditions. But there no excuses golf. I mean, the course obviously is going to be really difficult because of the setup, but you had a lot of really good players right there within striking distance. And, you know, whether it's the pressure or what, I don't know, but no one was able to really mount much of a charge, especially on the back nine. That was, that was kind of the difference between, you know, this year and, and it, last year, thinking about what Phil Mickelson did on Sunday last year, just went yeah. super low, right? And we, we really didn't, have that when you look at uh, I mean Scheffler of the guys that were in contention Scheffler went the lowest like there was no one that fired off that you know 65 and made things really really interesting and built that buzz it just it, it didn't come together felt like the core it felt like the course was a little bit too tough for that with those brutal greens but I mean, usually you have someone out there that goes low, and, but you can tell the difference in that course whenever it's a little softer compared to like what it was this week. I mean, that's whenever you, you get the true feeling of all the undulation and everything out there. It looked miserable when that day. And all you had to do was look at Jason day's pants to see how windy it was. <laughs> how about those things, man? I mean, those things were Fantastic. Let's not even talk about the sweater vest he tried to rock out there. Oh my gosh. But I like guys were barely tapping the ball and it was just flying on those greens. It, it oh. was stressing me out watching it on my couch. I was like, I, I don't know. like this. I don't want to, I, I don't like watching this. It makes me like, I'm scared. I, I, it's like, you get the same feeling whenever you're standing over a chip shot where you know there's no chance that I'm going to be able to get this to hold the green. I, it You feel it through the television. It's it, You're right. There's a bunch of anxiety watching those. And the putts, like, uh, you left it above the hole. I, and then they're just like, just a tap. Try to keep it on the green. That's, it's fun to watch, though. I mean, that's what makes it enjoyable is whenever the course is playing that difficult. And they look like us at times. Scotty Scheffler is, I mean, there's just no doubt the, the run that he's on. It's the best thing we've seen since prime tiger woods. Yeah. And I'm not sure he's even, I, I don't think Scotty Scheffler's even close to being in his prime yet. Yeah. You may be right. I'll say this, you know, like, for example, Max Homa has a beautiful swing. Whenever I watch him hit the ball, there's no part of me that says I can replicate that. But with Scheffler, and I'm not suggesting I can replicate that, but at least his feet look like my feet, you know? I, he's doing it, a shuffle while he's hitting the golf ball. Yeah, his yeah, feet look like, like my, my son's feet when he's hitting it. I'm like, Buddy, you got to keep your feet still. And we're down in the basement. He's hitting golf balls. We're watching the Masters. Scheffler's feet's moving all over the place. I'm like, you know what, son? Do whatever <laughs> feels good. Do whatever feels exactly. natural. Whatever. Do what your body tells you to do. You got it, buddy. You got it. Hey, uh, the I don't know if it's the best advice, but it's some advice that one of my uncles gave me a long time ago. Great golfer. It doesn't matter as long as the club face is squared impact doesn't matter what it looks like so there you go <laughs> maybe i should try this i i think i would honestly break my ankle it's going to be the new thing you know how it is that's what go everyone tries to copy everything there's going to be people's feet slipping out all over the place 
He's the best golfer in the world, and it's not even close right now. And you got to imagine that every golf instructor across the country is just telling every student they have, no, no, Don't you can't do that. It. You just, you, you, you cannot do that. Well, you know, I just, I want to like throw that right foot out at impact. You know, it just, it wants to go there. It just no. feels, it feels right. It's what Scheffler does. <laughs> Could be like a bunch of foot fractures, like left foot fractures, oh, yeah. like crunching that fifth metatarsal. The new thing is to wear a golf spike on your left foot, but not on your right. <laughs> it's all that tension. You got to release the tension whenever you go through the golf ball. The, and I loved how you, you, you went Oberg. You'll hear Aberg quite a bit, but I, oh, is, Oberg is the proper way to say it, right? It's the A with the little O on top of it. Well, yeah. And it's even like, you've got to put the right emphasis on the right syllable. It's like Oberg. Oberg. Yeah. He's going to be, he already is. I should know this. I interviewed him when he was at tech. Yeah. Golfing. Cause he was, he was like player of the year back to back years. We had him on big 12 radio. I, that guy is just from talking to some of the, the golf people that I know, it seems like that guy is going to be, an absolute dude for a long time. If he doesn't hit it in the water on 11, he may have made it interesting. But that one shot, you know, you get over there and like that's the, I mean, that's the experience thing. Uh, you saw where Scheffler put it on 11. It's like, don't even test that. That's not the green or the shot to test it on. And you just tug it a little more left than you want to, and it's gone. So, you know, you know, when you're, you're watching a sport with someone that knows a lot more about that sport than you, mm -hmm. you're ever in that situation. It's like some people watching football with us, mm -hmm. you know, and just trying to listen to some of the things. So we, I, I was at the Thunder game with, with Taylor Gooch, his wife invited, or uh, my wife invited his wife and him to come to the game with us. The second Oberg hit his tee shot on 11. He goes in the water very calmly. Just what he's literally it. They hadn't even showed like the tracker thing hadn't even showed up yet. And he goes in the water. What do you mean in the water? And they got to it. It went out of the water. I was like, yeah, I don't know anything about golf. Okay, cool. Yeah. Totally get it. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the crazy thing about that course is I've never even been there. And, you know, I know a lot of the holes and that's the thing you see. It's like that. That's the that's one of the most difficult shots there is. He's you can't even you can't even mess with it over there. But he's still he's fun to watch. He's he's kind of one the new guy on tour that's uh on my radar that I'll be paying attention to. Uh, the one thing I'll say about him, my one request. Adidas, don't turn him in, into Adidas Jordan Speed, okay? Let's get, let's get some more color. Like let, let, let's, let's get him looking a little bit style, a little more style. I, listen, I get the, the logo, the three stripe. I get it. Let's, I think let's get a little more creative. He's going to be a star. Don't, I don't know. I just feel like Jordan speaks under armor stuff. Just, he doesn't do it for me. Adidas figure something out for this guy. He's going to be a star. Get him some cool golf gear. Okay. It was a little too boring for me. Maybe Tiger will be the first to sponsor him with that hideous logo that they came out with. God. He's still mad about it. Yeah, I'm still mad about it. Which, you know. What did you think I about was, the logo location on Sunday? Underneath was, the buttons in the middle. How about that? It was interesting. I didn't really. I, I thought that that was fine. I'll tell you the funny thing. I yesterday I went to bed fully like prepared and thinking that there's no way Tiger's going to play on Sunday. And then I saw him I, when I turned it on, he was just starting on number one and he was wearing the, the Sunday red. I was like, wow, he's playing. And then I was like, ah, 
he had to he had to get out there in the new gear on Sunday. You can't not have the Sunday red with your new gear, right? Tremendous point. I I wanted the red to pop a little more. Was it? I, I feel like it was a shade or two too too dark for what I was hoping his Sunday red red would be. Yeah, I don't know. I'm more of a. I I would prefer the dark red myself. Take well, it was closer to an OU red. Bit. Yeah, it was That's closer to a I crimson prefer. than a red. Which you know, for them, you could have gone like the bright red anyways because he usually sweats through it so much that it turns the darker red anyways it's like a two-tone what do you think that was like for neil shipley that kid had to feel like he was like he was dreaming yeah not only did he get to play on sunday at the masters with tiger woods he played a lot better than tiger woods did you see the his press conference yeah first of all great hair on that guy Talk about just tremendous flow. You talk about the difference be- between body types of golfers. <laughs> oh, there my you gosh. go. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, I don't know what was with that. The some journalist says it looked like Tiger wrote a note down and handed it to you on one of the fairways, and he like looks over at someone and is like that didn't happen, and then I like, okay, press conference over. <laughs> I don't know what was going on there. I have no idea. Interesting. <laughs> I don't know, but that had to be, you talk about an all time cool experience. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, he bogeyed number one and then the stress was gone after that. Okay. I look like an idiot on the first hole. Now I can go play golf. You got anything else masters related other than that okay. awesome shirt from coach Hibble? Oh yeah. Gotta love it. You're Thanks, not sweating coach. through yours. Like I did. I'm proud of you. <laughs> It's so an awesome bad. shirt. I love it. Very All right, good. let's get to my winner and loser. But first, attention business owners, you need Insurica in your life. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective, comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. If your business wants to be best in class, connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A dot com. And head to OpolisClothing.com for our podcast merchandise and the best OU gear out there. That's O-P-O-L-I-S Clothing.com. Use promo code TED, T-E-D for 10% off. That's opolisclothing.com. Use promo code TED for 10% off. Buttery soft and 10% off. Also, great Oklahoma City basketball shirts on opolisclothing.com. For my winner of the weekend, thought about going with the UFC. Now, I have, I've never really gotten into the UFC like a lot of people have. But I feel like you had to be living under a rock if you're a sports fan and you didn't see Max Holloway knock out Justin Gagey. That was, what was it? A second to go in the fight. And for him to wave him to the middle of the ring and Holloway, he he had won the fight. The fight was over. He was going to win, but for him to take the risk and be like, Hey, let's put on a show and for Gagey to be like, yeah, let's do it. And those dudes just throw at each other like that. Dude, that was crazy. That was wildly entertaining. I'm sure that Gagey wished he didn't get knocked out. But it was, it, they, they gave the people what they wanted. The crowd yeah. went insane and just, I, it seems like it's, I don't know a lot about UFC, but it seems like it's one of the all-time UFC moments. Yeah, no, that that was awesome. I watched all the prelims too. There were some pretty good prelim fights. So, man, yeah, that's, that's crazy. And I, I just, Every time I watch the UFC, I the courage to knowingly step in the ring, knowing that you may get knocked out in front of the entire world is like, it's like one of us is coming out of here. The other is not. 
and I know you can go to decision and all of that stuff, but still, it's just, it's the ultimate in competition. It's good stuff. Dana White also announced that Conor McGregor will be making his return at UFC 303 in Vegas on June 29th. Going to be fighting Michael Chandler. That guy, it he moves the needle, man. What he, he hasn't is fought since as hell. Yep. He hasn't fought since July of twenty one. Has it been that long? It's Jeez. been forever. So that is so you had that moment with Holloway, and you mentioned a couple of other really, really good fights at UFC three hundred, and now the news that McGregor's coming back for three oh three. Solid weekend for the UFC, man. Yeah, no, it is and wildly entertaining to watch Conor McGregor. That Diaz fight, the first one from back in the day, was just maybe the best UFC fight I've ever seen. Just absolutely bloodbath, standing there toe to toe. It was great. Easy transition to OU softball, my winner of the weekend. <laughs> and listen, I I know what happened in Game Two against BYU. Nine four loss. Not great. First Big 12 loss at home since 2017. They left way too many runners stranded during game two. Pitching got hit hard. Listen, I get it. Did, didn't execute at the plate late in the game, which is just a foreign feeling for us as OU softball fans. I get it. But at the end of the day, you take two of three, win the series. You're still in first place in the Big 12. And Kelly Maxwell is looking good in the circle. Yeah. Yep. She was nails in game one and that shut out. She looked fantastic. Uh, Sydney Sanders hits the, the, the run rule walk off there, the three run Homer in that eight Oh win. But, and then Maxwell comes back in games three, game three and looks really good again. So I, I think that, and I'm not a soft, softball expert, but she appears to be emerging as that go-to arm for them. Yeah. And just with what we've seen throughout the years at the Women's College World Series, you you got to have one of those pitchers. And it seems like Kelly Maxwell is is getting getting to that spot. Ted, I I I've been really impressed with what I've seen from her lately and she looked she looked really good in the BYU series. Yeah, no, I mean, it's um, it, it's going to be interesting to see how the team responds moving forward. You know, I know they entered the season with a ton of pressure, and, and now it's like everything hangs on every loss. Um, they're not in an easy spot. I mean, they've got a huge spotlight on them. The magnifying glass is on the every move, but it's a good thing that Kelly Maxwell's coming around. You're still getting great play from um, like your, your consistent star players, you know, some, there's going to have to be some other players emerge and I'm confident that they will, but you know, crank the drama up, man. It's going to be a fun ending to, uh, to the regular season in the big 12. I'm with you. Jada Coleman. What is it? 29 games now on base street. That Crazy. catch she had in game three was sick. Dude, she's she's good for she's good for a catch like that. Like every couple of games, she does something insane out in the field. She's uh she's incredible. Kenzie Hansen, really good weekend at the play. Brito was massive for them in game three. So, you know, you you kind of wish game two didn't happen, but it is what it is. I think that. OU, they appear to be struggling right now, mm -hmm. Ted, but you think about what other teams' struggles look like, and then you compare them to what OU's struggles are. It it just it's not that bad, people. That's that's what I'm trying to say. It's not that bad. They're gonna they're gonna work through it. Well, it's honestly it's a lot like the Alabama treatment, you know, what you look at last season. And they dropped the game to Texas early and they're left for dead and they take the national champion into overtime, you know, with a chance to go to the national championship with Michigan and 
I still can't believe what happened in, in that game, but that's not the point. I, I think there's a lot of people ready to call time of death on the Oklahoma softball program I, at the first sign of adversity, but that ain't going to be the case. No. I do think that um, it would be a nice statue for for people to visit outside Love's Field here pretty soon. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Should be. Okay. Should be. A big deal that I'm sure the head coach will absolutely hate, but hey, <laughs> it is it is what it is, Patty. I'm sorry. That's what happens. That's the burden of winning. Okay. Yeah, you shouldn't have won so much. It's your fault. All right, my loser of the weekend. Thought about going with Kentucky basketball fans. It it seemed like I don't know if it was the majority of them, but a lot of them wanted John Calipari gone. He leaves, and I feel like a lot of Kentucky fans thought that they were going to get a big name. They were going to be able to brag about it. And Ted, it seems like everyone they went after said, no, thanks. Scott Drew, yeah. staying at Baylor. Danny Hurley, staying at UConn. Doesn't sound like Billy Donovan. Gave it much serious consideration. I don't know if they tried to get Nate Oates to leave. Bama, I assume they did. Didn't work. End up hiring BYU's Mark Pope. Now, he was the captain on the national championship team for Kentucky back in the day. And I actually enjoyed watching BYU, his BYU team this season. But he, when, when you talk about the type of guy that fan base thought they were going to get, Mark Pope does not have the credentials. He does not have the resume that I think they anticipated their new coach having. Right. Well, it may end up being a great hire for him, like maybe exactly what they need. You never know. But, man, it's it's interesting right now in college hoops, and it's always, it's always a, a question mark on whether you want to follow someone that was so ingrained in a program and one of the, the faces of the sport. Uh, you know, it's just th funny thinking about Billy Donovan. You know, whenever he first went to the NBA, I bet he was like, it, it is a pain in the ass managing a roster and like all of the, the back and forth with an NBA, like what goes on with the running an NBA team. And now he's probably like, it seems like a nightmare in college you know, building a roster and dealing with what goes on on a day-to-day -day basis in college. So it's like NBA is now the easier locker room. I don't know. Just, just funny thinking about it, but I don't know, man, we'll see what happens with Pope. It, it may end up being a great hire for him. I'm rooting for him. But yeah. when a guy goes back to his alma mater, for whatever reason, I'm always rooting hard for that type of guy, especially with how, how this particular hire, like the reaction to it. Well, there's, it's a lot of similarities between like North Carolina and, and Duke, what they ended up doing. Right. Yeah. So, you know, we'll see. I'm not going to write Mark Pope off. I'm going to give the guy a chance. I, I got no idea if it's going to work or not, but we'll see. But I know a lot of Kentucky fans were saying, we don't need coach cow. We're going to bring in X, Y, or Z. And I don't think Mark Pope was the name they were throwing out when they were talking that way to their buddies. Hey, here, here's I, I don't know anything about Mark Pope and his style and how he recruits. He is like 6'10", so at least you have a tall, like you have a tall yeah, yeah. coach. That's cool. Like Phil Jackson. Um, I'm pretty confident, though, that if you give him more NIL than anyone else in the country, you're going to have a very, very competitive basketball team. I will. I will also say this. It's a lot easier to recruit at Kentucky than BYU. Yeah. I saw some people be like, well, he wasn't recruiting at a high level at BYU. Are they aware of that honor code? It's, it's not exactly, it's not exactly the most appealing place for a lot of high level high school basketball players. Okay. Right. <laughs> just, I, I, I think they're going to recruit just fine at Kentucky, but we'll, we'll see. But my, my loser of the weekend, the new Orleans Pelicans are just impossible to figure out. Uh, all, 
if they beat the Lakers, if they would have beat the Lakers on Sunday in New Orleans, they avoid the play in. That did not happen. Lakers came to their house and got after him. And LeBron is just ridiculous, man. I mean, what he is doing with the number of games he's played at his age, 28, 17 assists and 11 rebounds in that game. Uh, Pelicans also no answers for Anthony Davis. He had 30 and 11. It, it's such a big game. If you're the Pelicans, your stars have to be stars, right? That's what you always say. Stars got to be stars. Zion had 12. Brandon Ingram came back for this game. He had, he had 13. So I now they got to play him again in the 7-8 play-in game. But a little wrinkle, Ted. In the fourth quarter, about five and a half minutes to go, Anthony Davis is back locked up on him. Like just locked up. And he was done. Now, after the game, said it's nothing to be concerned about, said he will absolutely be playing on Tuesday, but with his injury history, could I exactly buy what he's selling me there? I don't know, but that is, if they have a healthy Anthony Davis, like, I don't, I don't think, I don't think New Orleans can hang with the Lakers in a one game and you, you advance to do the playoffs from the play-in. I just, I just don't trust the Pelicans. I can't that's figure how it they, out. That's how the Lakers throw that game. To get You're the convinced the Lakers want the Thunder. You're convinced. Of course I am. Of course I am. Bring if it on. You, how, you, you know how much Lakers, fun that would be. Who would you want? Would you want OKC or Denver? Okay, you're making a very valid point. Yeah, you They're want Oklahoma City. the hell out of the Pelicans and Anthony Davis. Ah, ah, my back. Oh God! Ow, my back, <laughs> spinal. I just, <laughs> I, maybe you got a point. We'll see. We we may know with how that game looks between those teams. If I, I think the Le- the Lakers are going to try to win that game. But yeah, that's that's a fair point. But we'll see. You run the risk of, hey, you're playing Golden State and they hit 23s and then There's your season's no over. Doubt. There is no doubt. It's a lot, it's a lot to play around with for sure. There's you are absolutely right with about that. I mean, it, it would I would probably feel like one hundred percent all in on it if it wasn't Golden State hanging around there to be a team that they had to play to to secure it. Yeah. We'll see how New Orleans bounces back. Lakers don't have to go anywhere. They just get to stay in New Orleans, hang out for a few days, and then you know, get back at it. But we'll, we'll see how that 7-8 that playing game goes. Birthday shout-outs. Happy 49th birthday to Jeff Blakely. Happy 50th birthday to Amy Crawford. Happy 54th birthday to Honey Fries. <laughs> Happy 55th birthday to Judy Hosenfroz Vesper. I think you nailed it. <laughs> All right. Happy birthday, Judy. What an awesome name. Happy 70th birthday to Rick Prevost. Happy birthday to Steve Rockstar McCaleb. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and happy birthday <laughs> to Jim Pink Eye <laughs> Fisher. <laughs> There's got to be a story there, right? Oh, uh, definitely one of his friends sent that in. Happy birthday, Pink Eye. You're the man. <laughs> on that note, episode 413 in the books. We'll have a new podcast that'll so drop on Wednesday. Just a reminder please subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please tell all your friends to do the same we hope you all have a great start to your week and until next time we appreciate y'all for listening do what you always do oklahoma take care of each other